Well, the movie was a huge box office flop. Critics disliked it. Audience hated it. And now it's time for us to weigh in. So yeah, it's our Joaquin Phoenix Joker Folia Do episode. Dooby dooby do. Hi, it's Karen from Los Angeles. And this is Alex from Los Angeles, and welcome to Movies That Shaped Us. We are two longtime friends who grew up on opposite ends of the globe with very different backgrounds, but we're both shaped and are still being shaped by the movies we see and love. In each episode, we'll cover a filmmaker, an actor, director, or other creative who shaped our love of movies. Join us as we explore why they matter to us before reviewing the three movies in their filmography that made the biggest impact on us. Yeah, so, so thanks for saying the title of the movie because I can't speak French, so I appreciate <laughs> You, you doing that? I think I'll throw that to you anytime we have to talk about Joker. I'll just call it Joker 2. <laughs> like, I'm still <laughs> tripping up over that. But before we get into our thoughts on this film, which came out a couple of weeks ago, huge, you know, critical and financial disaster. So it'll be, I think, fun and interesting to talk about that in more depth. Let's start with Joaquin, the co-star of the film. So we actually did an episode, a bonus episode, a couple months ago before the release of Napoleon, where we talked through Joaquin and just in a different format where we went over his career in a little bit more detail, whereas this episode will be not only focused on Joker 2, but more of our own personal thoughts and dive deep into our favorite Joaquin performances are, are most interesting. So we talked a little bit about it in the previous episode, which again, I'll link down below, but why don't you just remind our <laughs> listeners or listeners who haven't listened to it, what is your history and, and thoughts on Joaquin Phoenix? Yeah, I mean, I feel like this is no great take, but I think he is probably one of the best actors of our generation and this generation. There was a time, I want to say, with Leo, which was sort of this movie star, really good actor who sort of disappears in his roles. And it was almost like an event every time a Leo movie came out. That's the other person I can think of. But I think Joaquin... I wouldn't call him a movie star in that right, but he's sort of those rare bird actor movie stars, you know, who's appreciated for his acting performances, his daring choices to really go into the role and dive deep and go out there. And there aren't that many kind of performers across the board that A, have that kind of pursuit of the craft, if you will, and acting, but are also big draws for audiences. There aren't that many people who are making, you know, smaller movies, but really big budget movies, whether it's a Napoleon or a comic book movie and could be potentially a billion dollar dollar grossing movie in the case of Joker one like that there aren't that many people out there Oscar winner celebrated so I think he's very unique in that way my personal relationship with him as you know as an audience member is really more of just admiration I think I've always felt that this is somebody who's singular and whenever he puts out something I do know that I would want to see it you know, which is pretty rare and incredible. And the thing that sort of sets him apart, other than his intense roles and choices that he makes and the kind of filmmakers he works with, that there's a bit of a office center sort of appeal to him, I think. But at the same time, it's packaged or can be packaged with some level of tenderness, which is such a fine line. And, you know, as we talk through his performances and think about his career a little bit more, I think he's always played with that line. You know, that line can be pushed all the way. Mostly it's all the way in the negative direction, but sometimes it's pulled in the opposite direction as well, which is really fun to see. But yeah, I mean, he's one of the most committed people who hurls his being, body, mind, all of it into performances. And that's a treat, you know, to go and watch somebody like that on screen. So I'm a fan. I've always been a fan. And it's amazing that someone like that continues to be celebrated and, you know, continues to make daring choices. So what about you? Yeah, very similarly, I think he's just someone who, because he found in sort of his early phase of his career with Gladiator, a lot of that mainstream success with a performance that was a little bit offbeat and off kilter, he then could parlay that into continuing to be that sort of a little bit offbeat, a little weird, not only in terms of performance, but in terms of material, take that and then shine more of a spotlight on it because he has that box office draw from what he was able to do with Gladiator and, and then walk the line. And, and me personally, you know, I definitely, knew about him as a young kid because of his brother River Phoenix was a lot more famous at the time and definitely was thought of as like the next big star in Hollywood and tragically passed away and I always sort of looked I don't want to say down upon Joaquin but like oh he's just River Phoenix's brother 
And I think he's proven himself. And maybe this is the, what's driven him to do a lot of these very offbeat performances. Like he's almost really trying to step out of the shadow of what his brother probably could have been, which is more of that matinee idol type of film. And I think maybe that's why Joaquin is always trying to do something different to not fall in the footsteps of what his brother's career could be, which I've always found interesting. Maybe this is all not true. I don't know. I'm just analyzing him from from afar in terms of his motivations but i definitely found his not only performances interesting but just his career choices Mm -hmm. like he does gravitate towards offbeat material you know be talking about two projects in, in this episode her and the master i think are both very offbeat out of left field type films but that he is one of the reasons why they they work as movies I mean, to varying degrees, but I, I do find that that is interesting and is using his power of, or at least audience attention to be able to do these things, which I've always, always admired. I will say as well, though, this has been interesting to me, this exploration into his career. Through these movies for this episode, it's in a way similar to when we did our Will Smith episode recently. I don't know if folks remember that one. We watched some Will Smith movies for Bad Boys 4, and it was a shock revelation to me that after mainlining Will Smith, like how actually much I really liked him, and I didn't really think about it in that way. And in this sense, it was kind of the opposite, oddly. Mainlining Joaquin Phoenix movies, like watching you know six or seven of them in a row and preparing of this episode it kind of turned me off to him a little bit and i sort of i don't know he's his shtick kind of shined through a little bit more in a bothersome way than i think it had in the past for me it was it was interesting like i'm starting to kind of get tired of him and more like a jared leto type thing where you can tell jared leto's trying incredibly hard all the time and he's doing these really weird offbeat roles, but it never really works. I'm not saying that Joaquin is exactly the same as Jared Leto, but I was starting to get those vibes after watching all these movies in a way where I think I need to put him down for a minute. (laughs) <laughs> to be honest, like mainlining Joaquin, I was like, do I like this? I don't know. Maybe I don't. And I don't want to question that. So I'm just put that put that aside. It, it was interesting, I should say, going over these films. Yeah. His career. Like, I just I don't know. Something about him is sort of rubbing me now the wrong way. Yeah. I mean, it sort of feels like even in the industry, with sort of what happened with the Todd Haynes movie that he sort of pulled out the day off. Oh, the right. Day before. Mm-hmm. I think the bloom is sort of coming off this weird rose if you will and I I get that too you know that he can be kind of tiresome anybody who's sort of so out there and doing crazy roles and putting himself out there all the time they can kind of become a meme of their own you know and I can also take this in doses only there's a stretch of movies that he did there's a Gus Van Sant movie he was never really there or something like that there are a bunch of these offbeat movies where he's just putting himself through misery and pain and we're supposed to kind of revel in that and I definitely had that period when I was like you know what I'm done with this and same goes for when you were saying earlier but in comparison with his brother when he was this whole thing of like my career is over him and Ben Stiller going on talk shows and making sort of a joke about that or mm-hmm. I'm not interested in any awards and what have you, but of course you are, right? You're in the business. So I've definitely had my share of kind of affection and not affection, or this is too much and I want a break sort of thing with him. I agree with you. Like you are right now. I might be in that phase right now as well, where I maybe I need a little break for him, but that doesn't take away from what he's delivered and what he's capable of and And I admire that for sure, you know, but yeah, he can only be taken in certain amount of doses. And it'll be interesting to talk about what we want to see him do next, actually, because I I definitely have some thoughts there. Yeah, me too. And maybe it's unfair for me even to say he's not like a Will Smith where you could sit down on a Sunday afternoon and just watch like a ton of Will Smith movies. Or I do this with Arnold Schwarzenegger sometimes. It's like with, with the roles that he chooses and the projects that he chooses, you can't really do that. And I think there is a way to overdose on him but sort of like have your fill and then you know wait and then yeah. come back this is definitely a, a rare thing to watch all the, you know his films in such a concentrated right. amount of time that's not what normally the public does either they see him no. once every year or something so maybe he's it's unfair for me to, to compare him to to big willie yeah at totally. least at least that's how i feel coming out of this and you know maybe to do with the the latest film too i don't know that could be a big factor in it too speaking of let's get into it what did you think of joker 2 well, first, I'll add, can, can you read the, the plot summary and things? Because I can't pronounce the title. So, and then, then I'll jump into to, to, to what I think about it. But I, I'm embarrassedly can't speak the French title of this. Yeah, happy to take it. Uh, so it's Joker Folie Ado, directed by Todd Phillips, starring Joaquin Phoenix, Lady Gaga, Brendan Gleeson, quick logline, struggling with his dual identity, 
failed comedian Arthur Fleck meets the love of his life, Harley Quinn, while incarcerated at Arkham State Hospital. Okay, so I'll tell my thoughts first on this. Well, actually, before I talk about Joker 2, just my thoughts on Joker 1, because I think that is important to, mm -hmm. to know going into this. I very much do not like the first the first Joker film. I've only seen it one time in theaters. Sort of general thoughts on it are just is not a very well made film. I think Todd Phillips is just not a very talented filmmaker, and he took on material and themes that are well beyond his capabilities as an artist. Basically, just throwing out a bunch of ideas on isolation and uh, societal, um, you know, austerity and and all these different things that yes, these are legitimate concerns in our society, but didn't really do anything with those things. He just tossed the themes out, even themes that are contradictory to one another and expected you as an audience to, I guess, piece that together, which I don't think is because he's so talented that it's sort of ambiguous on purpose. I think he's just not talented at all, though. I think the visuals are very interesting. I thought they did a great job with the production design and the world building of this sort of cribbing on Scorsese late 70s style. But overall, I think it's a bad film. The first one, uh, despite Joaquin, I think it's interesting what he did in the first movie, though, as a big Batman fan, I just think the portrayal of the Joker was just wrong. And like, what was the point if you're going to make a movie calling it Joker to pull no elements of what makes the Joker interesting in your film? Just call it something else. And that movie might have been a little better for me. So those are my thoughts on, on the first one. Going into the second one, I had very low expectations. Sometimes you walk into a movie being ready to, to dislike it, which is fine. Like, I still want to see movies I know I'm not going to like because maybe I might like it. There are those surprises that happen out there. But this movie was way worse than I had imagined. And I think actually I can't remember a movie I hated seeing in the theaters more than this. Everything that was wrong with the first movie, they expounded upon that. But the, the biggest crime, which is the thing that a lot of the movies that are bad have, is it was freaking boring just so incredibly boring this movie takes place basically in a room in a prison and then a room in a courtroom and then it's mm -hmm. over so claustrophobic but not in like a interesting way like it just was incredibly boring and joaquin's phoenix performance i just is so over it like i think there were some interesting things maybe you could say what we did in the first movie and this movie he's just playing a less interesting like more dialed down version of the arthur fleck character he created in, in the first movie which didn't even make it that interesting to watch like at least in the first one you're like oh what is he gonna do how's he gonna respond to this he was portraying his joker persona a lot more in that movie which even though i say it's not the joker that i love but at least it's some interesting performance that you want to see on the screen. You're like, what is he going to do? This movie is just him getting beat on, getting raped, getting kicked around, and that's it. Nothing is interesting about it from a perspective of the actor. And then I'll say one more thing about the musical numbers, because I think that's something important to touch on, and then I'd love to hear, hear your thoughts and see if maybe you love this film. But... <laughs> You know, I knew going in it was a musical. I think that was something that had been leaked. I had assumed then it would be similar to like Scorsese's New York, New York, which I think is one of his worst films by Country Mile in terms of how they handle the music. But if you're going to do a musical like this, which the musical sequences take place in like a fantasy type reality, like Chicago or something, the musical numbers, I expect them to be bigger. I wanted like an Elvis or Baz Luhrmann, Moulin Rouge type mm -hmm. production of these musical numbers because it was supposed to be his internal thoughts and he's this crazy guy supposedly. So what crazy things could he possibly be fantasizing mm -hmm. when he's thinking about these songs? But it was like he's alone in a room sitting on a chair with a spotlight on him and he's singing in a bad voice. I think they're purposely trying to make him, him sing poorly. Just uninteresting. Way yeah. too small. If you're going to do songs, which are, I don't really even like a lot of the songs they chose as a jukebox musical, but make them big musical numbers and get you out of this two rooms that the whole movie takes place. And so, yeah, I like violently hated this film just because, again, it was poorly made. I'm not even talking about the message in the movie or it's so dangerous, like all the things people said about the first one. But high level thoughts, hated it. What do you think? Loved it? <laughs> best movie of the year? Yes. Best movie of the year of the decade. No. I guess I'll remind it as well a little bit. But the first one, I actually liked it, to be honest. I thought it was well made. Of course, it's not sophisticatedly handling all these complex themes, but I was definitely very intrigued and engaged with the performance and how it looked and delivered whatever it was trying to say. And when you walk out of that movie, you are en enveloped by you know misery and the plight of this character. And it's a super committed performance from him. Of course, it has issues across the board and what have you, but I actually liked it, I would say, the first one. So when this was announced, I was actually intrigued by the premise that, oh, they're doing a musical, they have Gaga in this, and that could be interesting. And like what you were saying, that's kind of where my head was at, that, oh, they're going to really play with the inner monologue of this character 
really blow it up and that actually might be an interesting way to undercut all the misery and the darkness which you know was in the first movie but i thought would be more off in the second one as well oh but boy this movie is a slog it's just so boring like you said for the most part of it nothing happens to be honest right and the musical numbers are total let down you have gaga in your movie who can sing like crazy use her and it doesn't undercut the energy at all in fact it just sort of is a it's a vortex that just keeps going down and down and pulls you down with it but i think the biggest thing that's a disappointing thing to me which is that who is this movie for it's almost like todd phillips was like oh you think that my first movie was troublesome and had bad messages let me sort of give you an f you and it's almost like a giant f you to the people who liked the first one and also the people who hated the first one so it ends up delivering to nobody actually i would have almost preferred if he went even further in the direction of where the first one was if he wanted to make a second one but it's sort of nowhere you know ultimately it's sort of just a boring mess and with him i agree with you that we've seen this there's not much on the page there's not much in the movie for him to do anyway and guess what it sort of just becomes a one note thing nothing really happens from him either of course the movie looks good and you know the production design all of that when you do see it is good but there's nothing that grabs you you know the first one at least the great score by hilder and all those great sort of moments and visuals of him dancing on the steps and such no matter how dark and perhaps beating your own horn like they might be they are well done and they do stay with you this movie nothing stays with you and from the title itself like you said like why is it in french it just sort of <laughs> feels like somebody trying to blow their own horn way too much and kind of eating their own tail and guess what nothing is left at the end and all the things you said about him just not being a sophisticated director and not being able to handle all these complicated themes that he started it's almost like now it's all out on the open you know which you never want right like i i making movies is hard it's rare that a movie that's dark and complex and ends up making a billion dollars and starts a conversation bad or good whatever but it was a phenomenon the first one you know and you of course want to wish wish well for somebody who's had that kind of success to then come back and do something better but but this is almost like you know how people with imposter imposter syndrome or actors they, they always say like oh my gosh they're going to call and say oh you know we made a mistake we didn't want you right. we we found out that you're a phony this is kind of that it's sort of like yeah it's all out out there and it just you're a phony which is yeah. a sad thing you know ultimately i walked out feeling out of this movie just feeling sad that you put all this money you put all of this talent you know in Joaquin Gaga your entire team all the money that was spent in making this all this for what you know which is sad like we are in this in this weird state of movies this year particularly i haven't seen anything in the on the big screen and this podcast is testament of that that i truly actually liked or loved there's been nothing in Dead, from my Deadpool point of view and, Deadpool and Wolverine was a Anyway, for you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a huge hit with audiences, yeah. too. I think they're inside out, too. I mean, there's been movies that have done done well this year. But, They've but done I, well. I'm just saying, personally, for me, I haven't oh, liked anything. Oh, Oh, I see. Okay. And this was sort of like another slap in the face, mm. if you will. So, yeah, I'm I'm not in a good space when it comes to movies, at least from my point of view. They've done well, so I'm happy for that, for the industry, for sure. Yeah, I think definitely, to me, like, the the first movie I felt also was sort of a I didn't think again like the the guy was talented to to pull that off and now it's sort of even though yes it was a big hit obviously it was and a lot yeah. of people liked it but to me this this movie almost shows what I sort of saw in the first mm -hmm. one when I watched it I'm like this is just again some guy who's way in over his skis doesn't really know how to make a competent competent film 
And now that's what people are saying about this right. one. So I don't wait. I wonder if the, the second movie makes the first one worse in people's mind. Because there's a lot of things that if I look at this just as a, a Joker film, the first one was an origin. And throughout the entire movie, he's like, how is he becoming the Joker? And at the end, he becomes the Joker, you know, in the final mm -hmm. scene or whatever, which then the sequel, he gets to be the Joker, which is usually how this stuff goes. Mm -hmm. But in this movie, he's actually the Joker less than he is right. in the first one. It's almost like this is a trilogy, and we saw the first movie, which is when he becomes a Joker, and then we skipped over the movie where he is the Joker, and then this is the movie where he doesn't be the Joker anymore. And they only gave us the first one and the third one. There's no actual, like, beef in, the, in this hamburger. It's just two pieces of bread. So as sort of a <laughs> exploration of this character through the eyes of Todd Phillips, I think he just totally... Yeah, missed, what are you doing? It. Why are what, you doing it? Yeah, what, just make up some other character then. This is this is kind of what you want to do. And then you spend half the movie basically rehashing the first one. Like the court scenes are just, right. let me explain to you what happened in the first movie. Let me bring back these other characters. I mean, it's like the last episode of Seinfeld was like this and that universally is hated. So it's like, oh, let me take something that everyone hates and just do that in my movie. What are you thinking? And with Gaga too, I'll just say like, I, I am a Lady Gaga fan. I think she's great. I even like her performances on screen, which have had mixed results, but she was so wasted here. Yeah. She didn't have anything to do. She wasn't really in the movie. There was just no way was this any interpretation of Harley Quinn and in any way, shape or form. So again, just make up another character if you're not going to deliver something that relates to the character from the comics. And they make her sing bad on purpose, I think, you know, because... Yeah. That, you know, they don't want the Lady Gaga, but that's what in the fantasy sequences. I want to see Lady Gaga do her thing or at yeah. least contribute one new song. You're hiring one of the most popular pop stars in the world. And yet you'd use all these other older songs. Yeah. Like, that was Even like, though what she has her own album, something around her oh, right. coming out or it's already out maybe. So then yeah. I was like, oh, why don't you use a song from that? Musicals are so difficult, so tough to make mm -hmm. show you know song and dance in like an elegant way it's probably not the hardest thing to do but the fact that you're now trying to subvert that and undercut that because you're too smart to kind of make a musical right I'm like you first need to know how to make a musical to then sort of say oh i'm gonna go and screw up with that deliberately yes. no you don't get to do any of that <laughs> you know because you don't know how to do this in the first place yeah, absolutely not. I mean, I know this is the Joaquin episode, but we'll talk a little more about Todd Phillips here. I just, after coming out of this movie, he reminds me, and this, I kind of felt a little bit this way with Joker 1. He feels like he's someone who wants to be and thinks he is Adam McKay. So Adam McKay was the director of a lot mm -hmm. of amazing comedies oh, yeah. in the, the, the first decade of the century, Anchorman, Step Brothers. And then he moved into more kind of serious topic films with The Big Short and Don't Look Up and Vice. I think he can pull that stuff off. I mean, those movies, those last three that I mentioned, we're not all in out comedies, but he's using his comedic chops to make political points and have a message movies, if you want to call it that. And Todd Phillips also started out with gross out comedies, road trip, old school, hangover. And now he's like, oh, I can just take Adam McKay's career and I'll make these message movies like that arms deal movie he did, War Dogs. And then he's trying Joker to be like, oh, look, I'm making something serious. And now this one, oh, I can do a musical. Like you said, I'll I'll subvert the musicals like, dude. You're not talented. Pack up your toys and go home. Either give us old school too, or just go away. You know, there's this concept out there as director's jail, which is sort of where, yeah. you know, directors sort of get put in like a quote unquote jail because their movie bombed or whatever. And Hollywood won't work with them. That's what that means. But sometimes I feel like people should be in actual jail. And I think that we should put Todd Phillips <laughs> in an actual prison after making this movie. And I was sitting there in the theater, just looking at the walls, being like, how do I get out of here? Like, if I just smash this, do, can I do Kool-Aid Man myself out of this theater into the other <laughs> into the other screen? Because, like, I just want to get out of here. I felt like I was on Guantanamo Bay or something. Unbelievable slog of it. Just a, an absolutely terrible film. Pointless. Unrelenting. Yeah. And I sort of, again, in a way, like Joaquin Phoenix comes out of this a little bit unscathed because everything around him is also so terrible that I don't really focus on his performance, which again, right. I found incredibly boring. But again, the, maybe the material wasn't there enough or... No, you know, there, there is no material. There's no vision. There's no there, plan here. Exactly. I mean, a couple moments. Maybe the one thing I thought was sort of interesting is the scene where he's going to the courthouse and sort yeah. of practicing his laughter and, oh, how can I get back into this persona of the Joker again to give the people what they wanted? And I did like that one fantasy sequence when he's, like, killing everyone in the courtroom. I thought that was kind of fun. But, man, like, again, actual prison. I don't know how many years. Not life sentence. I'm not going to be harsh about this. But maybe 10 years in jail. No hard labor even. We could just put him in a cell and make him watch this movie is what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> as punishment but i'm very glad this movie is failing as badly as it did not only because i just don't ever want 
Todd Phillips near this franchise again in any way, but I think it's just desserts from what I felt was a terrible movie they delivered last time. I'm glad this one is getting totally destroyed. Yeah, it's for nobody, you know? It's just right. for him, I think. And yeah, it's it's just sad, disappointing. Oh, well, there it is, oh, Joker 2. I mean, people have already not seen it, so I can't say to them, don't see it, because no one did, so... <laughs> I don't need to say do, stay away as, from this movie as far as you can for the rest of your life. And if you ever see Todd Phillips in person, a citizen's arrest is what I will do. <laughs> okay, so moving on from Joker 2, which both of us are very happy to do, we're now going to go into the rest of our episode, which is to go over our Joaquin Phoenix film. So this is going to be three movies. We'll start with our first love, which is the movie that first made an impression on us, like which was the Joaquin movie that first gave us that Joaquin impression where we then fell in love with him as an actor. Then Masterpiece, this is the movie that resonates with us the most personally that Joaquin has been in. And then finally, The Wild Card. This is another movie that's important to us and could be any specific way. Maybe it's a big swing that he took that didn't work. Maybe it's a movie that was overlooked that we think is a something uh, undercover gem for him. Yeah, let's get into our episode. So starting with you, Karan, what is your first love of Joaquin Phoenix? All right, so my first love is Walk the Line, 2005, directed by James Bangdall, starring Walking Phoenix, Reese Witherspoon, Jennifer Goodwin. Quick log line, chronicle of country music legend Johnny Cash's life from his early days on an Arkansas cotton farm to his rise to fame with Sun Records in Memphis, where he recorded alongside Elvis Presley, Jerry Lee Lewis, Carl Perkins. What a weird log line. I guess that's true. <laughs> All the facts. I guess I'm cheating a little bit because I probably saw him in The Gladiator before, but obviously it's a supporting performance. And spoiler alert, we might be saving our Gladiator thoughts for a little known sequel that might be coming up later in the year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Stay tuned for that. Yeah. But I do think Walk the Line is sort of, at least for me, the big introduction to Walking Phoenix. And I just remember watching this movie for the first time and, you know, growing up in India, not really knowing much about Johnny Cash or country music or even this actor really, and just being so struck by the way he looks like his signature sort of lip scar thing, the music and how tormented, but also charming and enigmatic he is playing this role the music, the singing, the tumultuous relationships he goes through. It's a pretty dark movie right from the very beginning, like, like the father-son relationship and such that they show watching Arkansas and kind of farmland and all of that life from a distance. Like it just all felt so captivating to me. I have not watched this movie many, many times in my life, but I have a few times. And, you know, the music biopic formula is sort of tried and tested. It's not one of my favorite genres to come back to because it's just so tropey, especially the ones that I've made in the last like five years. But I would say this is actually a pretty good music biopic. And a lot of it has to do with, I think, James Mangold. But I think a lot of it has to do with Joaquin and Reese, who are both incredible. And he especially... I'll pass it on to you and then we can get into thoughts on the movie. But I think this is why it's my first love of him because it has all his signature things of a walking performance. There's intensity and trauma and him wrestling with all of that, a complete commitment, deep dive into the role and the character. But then you also see the charming and en enigmatic side of him, like I said, which to me is sort of the classic Joaquin thing. And it's a movie star performance, despite being an actorly performance who's somebody who's dark and complicated and messed up and doesn't always make the right choices and decisions, but you can't look away from him because he's just so captivating. So that's why this is my first love of his. Had you watched this movie? Probably. Yeah, I had seen this movie when it when it came out and similar to you, like this almost became my first love or even masterpiece. Honestly, I chose two other mm. films instead, especially because we got, we got to talk about it here. But I think this movie in terms of the Joaquin mm. piece, especially on this rewatch of it, a lot of, I think the success of the film is due to him and how he handles this part. I mean, yeah. he, he could have very easily played this with a boring performance. I mean, you're relying on some of the greatest songs that have been ever been written. It's a very interesting story anyway, but what he puts into this, I think is two things. One is in the beginning of the film, when he plays the young Johnny Cash, he's very socially awkward and you can really see how music became this outlet for Johnny Cash to express himself and to almost find himself. And I think a lot of that is due to what Joaquin brings, not so much necessarily the material. And the other thing that that is in this movie is, which is true, like Johnny Cash had a, another brother who died when he was young. 
much like what happened to Joaquin in terms of having, he had a brother as well. And a theme of this film is Johnny Cash through Joaquin's performance, dealing with this guilt of should the other brother have died? Like I'm the lesser one. I have to now prove myself. I have to do all these things. And I think maybe Joaquin was attracted to this because he maybe felt the same way about his brother River dying and who was much more attractive than him sort of had, he was on the career fast track. And I think Joaquin then brings a lot of that into this performance of Johnny Cash, where you really do feel this like tortured nature and understand why he's acting out so much, why he falls into drugs many times, why he's a womanizer. It all kind of, I think, stems back from those moments early on in the film, which are pretty cheesy. I mean, there are parts of this movie that are fall into the biopic formula that, that you mentioned. Oh, yeah. But I think it separates itself from the rest of those movies, a lot of it due to Joaquin and a lot of it also due to Reese as well. And I'm also just impressed every time I see this film with the fact that Joaquin learned how to play the guitar and learned mm -hmm. how to sing for this movie. Mm -hmm. And it's it's great. Like, I think he does a, a great good. job with both those things. And it helps with the believability of this being Johnny Cash because he's actually doing all of the playing of the guitar and the singing. It's just a really a remarkable performance that a lot of folks... You know, maybe nowadays they try to do this. I think Joaquin could have been one of those people that set, set the bar high for, hey, if you're going to do a music biopic, you got to learn how to play whatever instrument this musician played and not do the lip syncing thing either. Yeah, no, it's total commitment from body posture, every look and glance. And the good thing about, I guess, this performance, and at least in my mind for any biopic is where... Yeah, you want some signature mannerisms and looks and such of the person, but you really want to communicate the essence of the person and who they really are. And I think mm -hmm. he evokes that, even though I didn't know much about Johnny Cash, but like you were saying, you can follow along with this person, why are they are, why they are the way they are. Because that's the point of storytelling, especially biopics, is to show the hidden, show that sort of what's underneath the surface and then just covering the plot beats of someone's life, right? right? That's what you really want to get to. And they do that. He does that. And I think the other big thing, the success of the movie, I think is their relationship, his and Reese's. There is this undeniable kind of connection and chemistry. At the same time, you know, this relationship is doomed because they hurt each other. They bring out maybe not the best size in each other, but they also get each other. And that's powerful stuff. They're really in it together, which is amazing to see. And and then music, right? Like you can't help but not get wrapped up in this music. I think it's the best use of songs and music to really tell the story and communicate the pain of these people and the connection of these people. It's a great contrast to what we were saying with Joker Folia Do, where music ends up becoming a bore it's the opposite. Like these songs, they you can't help but not feel the pain of them, but also rejoice in them. Like the famous scene of him at the it's a prison, right? Like, and you know the, the two characters they haven't seen each other in a long time. They're coming together. So much baggage there of their relationship. They're out of prison, but you can't help just be swept up in the music. And of course, you know how he sings it, how they sing it, how they deliver it. So yeah, it's cheesy, it's corny. At the same time, you can't help but not just get drawn to it. So I was very happy to rewatch it for the podcast. And for me, this will always be like the first Joaquin thing in my head. Yeah, yeah. I, I was an, a joy to rewatch this too. And to your, your point, I think the Reese Witherspoon relationship and the fact this movie is essentially the meat of it is a romance mm -hmm. makes it more interesting, more compelling, and I think separates it from the rest of, of the biopic. They also, you know, deal with the music where it's not so much the focus. Like the music's there. He's a great musician, but it's about his life and how he's right. traversing this relationship. There's not a scene where it inspires him to write like Ring of Fire because he looks over and he sees a Ring of Fire and like a barbecue pit. <laughs> like a lot of things that can happen in these music biopics. They try right. to be too on the nose of how did he come up with this song? Instead, it's look at this person's life. Look at all the things that he went through. And that makes him someone who then can put that into his music. You understand the music through the life and not through some other cheesy, you know, we're in a recording session. It's, oh, that we accidentally hit this button. And look, now we have this song. Like, that can, again, happen a lot in these films. And I think also at this movie, it just shows how much Joaquin can play like a romantic leading man. Like yeah. he's handsome in this movie. He's very yeah, charismatic. He, he holds the screen with Reese Witherspoon. And this is one of her most amazing performances too, but she's, he's not overshadowed by her energy. They balance off each other very, very well. It's a great two-hander and, and just something that I think at this point in his career, he could have decided to, I'm only going to play like these romantic leading man roles. And he didn't, but I think he can do it very well. And this movie proves that out. 
I totally agree. It's a movie star performance, you know, despite Absolutely. being actorly and deep and intense, all the things we associate with Joaquin. And it's great to see him in that light, you know, like a leading man, like you said. All right. What is your first love of Joaquin? My first love goes back a little bit further in his filmography. It's 8 millimeter from 1999. IMDb plot summary, a private investigator is hired to discover if a snuff film is authentic or not. Directed by Joel Schumacher, starring Nicolas Cage, Joaquin Phoenix, and Jan Gandolfini. So much like I said, like I almost put Walk the Line potentially as my first love because I really thought he impressed me in, in that film. And then also Gladiator, which we'll be talking about. Also, I thought that was a scene stealing performance there. But when I first think of Joaquin Phoenix and what and I first did have an impression on him, like, like I was saying in the intro, it was as a character actor who was River's brother. And this movie, when I think mm -hmm. back on, OK, what was the first movie that I really remember being like interested in a Joaquin Phoenix performance and where I thought he I don't want to say stole the movie, but it's definitely one of the a good part in the film was mm -hmm. this movie, Eight Millimeter, which I saw you know, back when it came out, not in the theaters. I rented it on, on VHS and this movie, Nicolas Cage stars in it, but you know, I'll talk about the Joaquin stuff first and then hear your thoughts and we can get more into the film. But Joaquin's character comes in maybe after the first act and the second act of the movie is really becomes a two hander between Nicolas Cage. Who's again, investigating this is this snuff film, which is a film where it shows someone getting killed. Is it real or is it fake? And during his travels to try to figure this out, he runs into Joaquin Phoenix who plays like a, a sex shop, owner basically or worker at the sex shop that then he goes on this adventure and they're doing this detective story together and that's when the movie to me really does come alive and Joaquin is playing this unconventional sort of uh, weird could could be like a sleazy guy but he rounds him out a little bit so that you sort of feel like he's a I don't know like a, not a such a weird or awkward person I mean yeah he works in, in a sex shop and he's dressed kind of like out of the British band the prodigy or something but <laughs> there's something that, that like makes him feel like oh I actually want to learn more about this guy and I want more of the movie to be Nicolas Cage and Joaquin Phoenix going on and doing this investigations and spoiler alert he doesn't end up living to the end of the movie um, and when he gets mm -hmm. taken out of the film it, the film I think really just stops kind of dead in its tracks it's not a great film anyway and again we can talk I can talk more about my thoughts on the film but that part of the movie was very engaging and it was more so because of what Joaquin was bringing to this more offbeat, interesting kind of comedic performance in this role than what Nicolas Cage was doing or what the movie did overall. So this one was stood out in my mind as a early Joaquin film that I really thought he was the best part of, honestly, even though he's just sort of a character actor performance essentially. And I've been curious if you'd seen this before and what impression you had of Joaquin in eight millimeter. Yeah, I never seen this movie before and it was fun. Well, it's not a fun movie, but it's interesting to kind of watch him younger like this. Like you said, he's awkward and maybe not in his best shape, which is sort of the character, you know, mm -hmm. has like belly hanging out from like crop tops and what have you. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and there's this weirdness to it, like you mentioned, which is a theme that we'll see in Joaquin's entire career. But I think there's also sweetness to him in this character, which is also another theme that we see from him where you're almost like, oh, are you innocent? Or maybe you're not the sharpest tool in the box or what is going on with you. But at the same time, there's attraction or at least interest as an mm -hmm. audience that you want to learn more, like you were saying, because, you know, anybody who's playing something like that can be like, oh, maybe too flat or not as engaging. That's the word I was looking for. But there's mm -hmm. always something engaging with him. And that's true here, too. The rest of the movie, I mean, we, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. It's, it's not a good movie. But yeah, he was probably the best part of it. And yeah, it was fun to watch him in kind of his earlier days. The other movie that I always think of him, which I didn't put as my first love, but it's the one with Nicole Kidman. To, exactly, to die, die for. for. Yeah, exactly. That's the one that I always think of from his younger days, which again, he's amazing in. But yeah, this is like a different register of off-center, weird, but also kind of sweet so yeah, it was fun to see him. Yeah, I think the sweetness thing is important to this movie. Yeah. It's sort of like a levity maybe too in, in how yeah. he is sort of a little silly but feels authentic and not like a caricature of what this role could be in a mm. movie that is very dire. But yeah, I don't like the film. I don't think it's very successful. And it's because it's almost trying to be too dire. It's like, oh, we're going to make a really dark movie about underground sex rings and all this stuff and, and try to make it overly dour and it just comes across as I don't know like kind of silly because of that and yeah just like you're trying too hard 
like okay we get it this is like a some sort of secret underground sex ring or going to these crazy like snm shows and things like okay like this is not interesting and maybe now this is kind of dated and maybe at the time it was shocking and like 1999 to see this i don't know i just feel like this could be on a a cable show now in terms of how they're how they're handling this it just feels very um pedestrian almost exactly but it's weird like on one hand yeah trying to be too serious but also to me this this felt like there's something off with the tone of the entire movie like nicholas cage feels like he's just doing a nicholas cage bit where it doesn't seem like he's serious about any of what's going on the music choices are all over the map yeah. in terms of like makes it sound like fun that oh we're gonna go and investigate this thing so on one hand it's very serious at the same time it's not taking these terrible things that are happening very seriously I was kind of bothered by that to be honest especially Nicholas Cage's performance and just the tone of the movie to the point that it becomes unrelenting I will say that the first I want to say hour though Everything feels very staged and, you know, Nick Cage, once again, like I said, like, this is not a good performance, but the premise of it is interesting. Like, you want to know what is going on and what would they really uncover and such. So I was intrigued in that, just having not read or known anything about the movie. But as it went down, it kind of became unrelenting and especially to your earlier point like Joaquin stepping in was definitely a breath of fresh air which is not something I would normally say about a Joaquin performance typically right because he always <laughs> plays, plays such like dour crazy in fact he would be one of the people in those SM shows probably you know doing right. like really weird out there things but instead it's kind of nice to see him not do that this was not a fun watch <laughs> at all yeah, I think the the tone of it is kind of off too. When I was yeah. r- watching this, is I felt like the lighting and the cinematography was almost like kind of too glossy and sheen, like too much sheen on it for what you would yeah. expect from something like this. Which you know, this movie was written by the guy who wrote Seven, the, the Fincher film mm-hmm. from the mid '90s, and this is definitely during that age of sort of Seven knockoff movies. And this falls yeah. into that category of oh, how can we shock you and and sort of make you look you know, look at this horrible thing that's happening. But I think handled in the right hands with Joel Schumacher. I mean, he's definitely no David yeah. Fincher. I and mean, even Fincher sort of tried the similar thing with the, his adaptation of Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, I feel like is very similar. But the the cinematography and the tone of that movie matched the dark tone of what that, yeah, what that film is. And this movie feels like the material, maybe at the time they didn't want to make it so dark. So they put like a lighter kind of sheen on things and a little more glossier and it makes it feel just like a normal kind of 90s blockbuster, even even though it's about these like horrible things and showing horrible things. It's just some mismatch there. Then again, I put, I think more on Joel Schumacher and maybe the material was hurt by the studio or something. Then even I do Nick Cage. I think actually this is a serviceable Nick Cage performance. I think I can't see really another actor doing what he was tasked to do with in this movie and still kind of being interesting. But Joaquin, like you said, is the the sweet spot in this movie as the, as a sweet, fun sex shop employee, <laughs> I guess in his crop tops. <laughs> Okay, so that was our first loves. Why don't we move into our masterpiece category? So, Karan, what is your masterpiece for Joaquin? My masterpiece is the master. Ha ha. Oh, what a pun. Hey, now. <laughs> From 2012, directed by Paul Thomas Anderson, starring Joaquin Phoenix, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Amy Adams. Quick log line, a naval veteran arrives home from war, unsettled and uncertain of his future until he is tantalized by a cult and its charismatic leader. So we actually covered this movie in our most memorable movie theater experiences. This was on my list. And I talked a lot about the movie, but also like how difficult this movie was for me to watch to the point that I had to leave the theater. (laughs) And it's funny that now this is like, a masterpiece category for me, not just for Joaquin, but just as a movie, because this is such an achievement in my mind of the scope of what Pop PTA is able to deliver. I think all three lead performances are absolutely incredible in him, Hoffman and Amy Adams. But I think to me for Joaquin, this is sort of the extreme pinnacle I, I I would think of him like really committing to that intensity that we've been talking about from the very beginning of what he brings to his roles to the point that the scars on his face his body contorting 
it's just such a lived in performance that you're completely transported. And of course, it's not just him. It's all the elements, the mise-en-scene of the movie, like we always talk about on this podcast, it's all working in service of that. And there's something so off about him. There's again, a sweetness to him for sure as well. But normally what we see in a walk-in performance where there's like sweetness and awe-centeredness, there's also some level of intelligence versus this person is just completely like a blank canvas. Like there's so much damage there. And which is why when he meets Lancaster Dodd, it sort of all takes off from him because he becomes kind of a muse and this empty canvas, if you will, for, for Philip Seymour Hoffman's character. So I think to me that that's what shines in this movie is that yeah, the intensity and the sweetness and the vulnerability is there, but there's also something else going on with that. And then I think the true romance, if you will, of the movie is the relationship between the two of them. And it, it, the, the two of them played with such shades, their buddies, their master disciple, their brothers, their father and son. They're also lovers. Like Not that anything sexual happens between the two of them, but they're just so many shades to this relationship between the two of them. It's it's mind-blowing. I mean, this is a hard watch. This is not your Sunday afternoon movie that you would just like put on. It's it's pretty unrelenting. But I think the more times I watched it, I I just feel like he's doing some otherworldly work in this movie. And I mean, I'm a PTA fan for sure. There are other movies of PTA that I probably want to watch more often, especially his later career movies. But in that era of PTA doing, you know, super intense, dark movies, it's this and there will be blood for me. Yeah, so I'd seen the movie before, like we talked about it on, mm-hmm. on the podcast. And I'll talk more about like the thoughts on the film when we get to that part. So I'll start with the Joaquin piece, because I do think this is one of his most interesting and challenging performances because this movie does not really have a conventional narrative. Yeah. Nothing really happens in the movie. It's like you said, more of this character study and relationship between Philip Seymour Hoffman's character and Joaquin Fiennes' character. So it's his performance that kind of has to, or at least for me, keep my interest in the film because he, the movie follows him. I mean, Hoffman is, is in there too, but it's not as much of a movie about Philip Seymour Hoffman as it is, is with Joaquin Phoenix and it's his sort of odd performance with this odd character that you just are trying to figure out like, why is this guy like this? Like, what is he trying to get? What is he, what is motivating him? Where is he coming from? Where is he going? And it's the way that Joaquin portrays this guy. Like you said, there is sort of a two sides of this where it's almost kind of like a serial killer performance in a way where like he can Mm -hmm. operate a normal society and you know, he gets some women. It's not like he's some weird guy off in the corner, but there's something off with him. And then when they get past that surface level, it's there's something else going on there. And that's what the movie is exploring and what the movie is kind of about or at least i'll give you my theories on now what i think this movie's trying to do but if it was another actor's hands or if joaquin wasn't committing as much as he does to this this movie would be boring i think the, the movie has to have a lead that can, or it would can be make overdone i think or know, the opposite of that role right role is so easy to kind of just really flex your muscles and mm-hmm. you know eat the scenery and though that is happening but it's it's so authentic and lived in and jaw dropping that you're completely taken for the right exactly and and that i think is joaquin's thing that he can do i'll do another pun then you did one at the start he walks that line between being, you know, giving you some eccentricity character, but not like overstepping that to go too crazy or lose some kind of empathy that you have or interest that you have, engagement that you have in who this person is. I think this movie, because it kind of lays everything bare, because there really isn't a lot else going on on the screen. It's just him that it just shows his acting chops and, and power as an actor for sure. So I think this is a, a good good choice in, in that sense in terms of a masterpiece for Joaquin. And again, I don't think anyone else could have done this. Yeah. And also, I think it's great to see his and PTA's relationship. And they've worked together several times. And I do think it's sort of the perfect match in my mind of kind Mm -hmm. of really bringing everything that Joaquin has to offer. PTA is probably one of the most interesting, smart, just thoughtful directors. You know, he's sort of in that pantheon of directors that at least of our time. So I'm happy that they found each other, you know, because there's a very specific kind of director who can really get 
everything and more out of someone like Joaquin. It's again, a great contrast to Todd Phillips, you know, right. it's almost like Todd Phillips <laughs> sort of feels like, oh, I can be the PTA and kind of get something otherworldly out of him. But of course, you know, <laughs> that doesn't Didn't happen. Work. So. Exactly. Yeah. And, and on the film, actually, so I, as we talked about the last time we discussed this movie, it's not a favorite of mine. I struggled a lot with it when I saw it in the theater and actually haven't revisited it since, since then. And it's a movie I've been curious about revisiting now that I've sort of read a little more analysis on it and, you know, potential themes. Cause I definitely was honestly confused when I first saw this, I think a lot of it had to do with going into it, expecting a first there was rumors like it was about Scientology, which it sort of is, mm -hmm. or about, you know, the power of, of cults and sort of a walk you through of how like a cult develops and grows in power, which is thematically that's what that movie what the movie's doing, but it doesn't really do it in the plot. So it's it was hard for me to kind of follow that. And yeah, on, on this watch, that piece of it came through a lot more that it's it's really just a sort of treatise on the generation coming back from World War II and how they deal mm -hmm. with this new, more alienating atomizing society that was built in America in the 50s at that time. And either you struggle to find some kind of meaning and go too far into the base desires and the just following the in and, and you know, sex and, and violence and all these things that Joaquin's character really represents. He goes to the extreme that way. And Philip Seymour Hoffman almost goes the opposite way in terms of over-intellectualizing everything and then thinks of himself as this amazing, smart, incredible guy that everyone needs to follow because those are sort of the two things that were inside of all the folks you know coming back from from the war in terms of how they wanted to fit into society now coming back the other piece of it that i just did not understand when i first saw it too was the fact that it's shot in 70 millimeter and mm -hmm. i expected again going in oh my god this is amazing like you know this will be some grand sort of epic scale picture and it absolutely wasn't a lot of it is close-ups and medium shots and then this time it sort of dawned on me, which ironically, like it was on TV and I watched it at home, not on 70 millimeter, not in a theater. And at least this is what now I interpret this to be is, you know, 70 millimeter brings a lot of clarity to things. Like you can really see like deep into the, into the frame and all these shots are just this weird stuff going on where so everything is out in the open. Philip Seymour Hoffman's character is not trying to trick anyone here to pull some sort of fast one. He just outlined this philosophy. Everything is sort of right there, but people still gravitate towards it. Yeah. Which I think, again, make this, I make, make, with how I interpreted that is this thing was not some secret thing, some secret cult where it's like everyone's in the shadow. It's like, no, he's going out there and doing this stuff. And then people are coming to him anyway. You know, it's like a horror movie where there's no shadows. The killer's right there. You can see him or her the whole time. That is part of the horror in a way. It's more scary, actually. There's so much transparency on what's going on. And yet people still get gravitated towards this, this weird guy and his, his ideas. I liked it a little better on this rewatch, but it's still, I still kind of bump up against it. It's not, I wouldn't put it as one of my top like three or four favorite PTA films, but I know the art is there. I don't say it's not a good movie. I just don't connect with it as much as I do some of his, his other films. Did anything changing for you over, over the rewatch? Yeah, I think for me, the movie's only grown in meaning. Like I said, I could barely even watch the movie. I left it because it was just so jarring and just so intense the first time I watched it. And the particular scene was when he's like hurling his body in the jail cell. I just couldn't take it the first time I saw oh, it. Yeah, and I think yeah. it's just too disturbing. But then I think as I've watched it over and over, only a few times, I should say, it's not about the plot beats, though I understand what they're trying to say. But yeah, like you said, it's about the meaning. It's about what these people are going through and their relationships. And and yeah, the 70 millimeter is for purpose. Like you see in these big rooms where the people are sitting and how they're drawn and the things that are happening in the background, the stuff that Amy Adams is doing mm -hmm. of like pulling the strings. And it's a new world being formed post-war and people are unsure and you get it. Even though this person is Philip Seymour Hoffman, He's not a good guy. He's manipulating across the board. He might deep down inside probably be like Joaquin Phoenix, but he's chosen to put this facade, somehow escape that. And that's why the two of them connect. And she knows that. She sees that. And the, But she's keeping the facade going because people want and need something to believe. And that's why they are drawn to him because he is charismatic. And that's the one thing he knows it. And she knows it, that this is one kind of lifeline that we have that we can hang on to in this new kind of wild, wild west. But right. then there are people like Joaquin who have nothing to really hold on to. 
And when they see that lifeline, they grab onto it, but it's very fleeting because the whole thing is very fleeting, actually, because it's not real. No one really knows how to be, who to be. And that's the part that just keeps growing deeper in meaning. And then sort of the mise-en-scene, like you were saying earlier, the music and the wide scope of it, the color palette of the movie, it's just so strange and beautiful. And that's the thing with PTA, right? Like Magnolia probably feels like a very accomplished student film where there's like a million things going on. This to me feels like somebody who's come off that is very sure in what they're trying to say, employ and deploy all the aspects of filmmaking to communicate that. But there is still, of course, a seriousness to it. And there is maybe even a heavy handedness to it, but it's done in the most deft way possible in my mind, which is why I'm very happy to see PTA doing more like lighter stuff. He's come off of that. And I like that better. But as a movie movie, this is, I think, the, one of the most accomplished movies he's made. Yeah, I think I could agree with that, even though it's not one of my favorite films. I don't connect with it as well as I do. Like, There Will Be Blood or even some of his more recent ones. But definitely mm. in terms of the mastery of the craft, I think this is a big mm. step up for him for sure. And a lot of that, again, is due to his relationship with Joaquin and what they were able to do together with this. Yeah. All right. So with that, what is your masterpiece? My masterpiece is the movie Her from 2013. This movie is obviously starring Joaquin Phoenix, Amy Adams, and uh, the voice of Scarlett Johansson. It was written and directed by Spike Jones. And the INDB plot summary, in the near future, a lonely writer develops an unlikely relationship with an operating system designed to meet his every need. So for me and why this is... I think Joaquin Phoenix's masterpiece performance, at least for me, is because of the challenge in this movie that he had to do, which a, a number of things that I think were were very, were very difficult. The first one is, like the movie describes, like he falls in love with an operating system, which in this movie is just a voice. It's like Alexa or Siri. So you never see Scarlett Johansson's character. You just hear her voice. So a lot of this movie is Joaquin Phoenix doing these very emotional and very difficult scenes to act completely alone like there's no one he can act off of um, at all he just it's just him he's some whether it's an extreme close-up a medium shot it's just joaquin like unloading all these incredible emotions i mean this movie really does encapsulate so much of like what relationships and human relationships and love and all these things are which I'll, I'll, we can get more into the the overall film but again mm -hmm. on the joaquin piece and, and the second thing is too it is a weird thing to even think of and maybe not so much nowadays mm -hmm. in 2024 but back in 2013 you know to think that a person could fall in love with a, a computer and you feel empathy or understanding for that scenario happening at all without coming across as who's this weird guy. You'll see those shows back in the day where it's like, oh, so this person's in love with his car and like he marries his car. And it's like, that's <laughs> that guy's weird and bizarre. Like, I don't get it. Whereas that's sort of what, at least I wouldn't go into this movie and be like, how's this going to work? Like, what do you mean fall in love with a computer? Like, this is just going to be some weirdo that I don't care about. Like, how can you care about a relationship that isn't real? I mean, that's like a lot of these questions the movie's asking. But he makes it work like you really I mean, this is like, a, a you know, a leading man performance too, and like a romance, even though it's just him with a voice. And he's able to bring this empathy and relatability to this character that on paper could be sort of seen as like, who's this weirdo? Like, OK, like, I don't care. You're some weird guy who's like falling over the computer, like go out there and meet a real person. Like, come on. But I never feel like that at all in watching this movie. And it just sort of unlocks a lot of other things just about the human experience and human condition. But we can get into more of the thoughts of the film in a bit. I'm curious on your thinking of Joaquin's performances. I know you've seen that. You know, you've seen yeah. this film, too. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing weird about him or the movie or the character at all, because it's his performance, but also I think the movie very quickly sets you up in this new world, which is not in too much of a distant future. You know, once again, the mise-en-scene of this movie is just so powerful that you are on the right, right, right away. You don't question it. And it's just so brilliant that things feel familiar, but also just different enough and slightly in the future enough that it doesn't distract from the stuff that might be going on in like a science fiction-y kind of movie. So it's just such a fine line of making you believe. But it's Joaquin who really does that in his performance. And we've been talking about the sweetness and vulnerability of his characters and him as a performer. 
I think this is that piece dialed up all the way. And he's done that a few times in his career. Mm -hmm. And I think this one probably is the most successful of all of them. I mean, he's always good. Right. I think the movie sort of serves him right. The character serves him right and rises to the occasion of what he's delivering that I will never forget that moment of watching this movie the first time when he says that, oh, you've been talking to other people as well. Oh, yeah. It's just so heartbreaking mm -hmm. to see that. And the moments he has like laughing away with the little sort of eye body like thing with her, with the camera swirling, it's powerful, deep, but very simple stuff of just falling in love, you know, and walking around in this lonely place, if you will, and the heartbreak, then when that hits you. At that time, I remember watching this movie and being like shocked and surprised by, oh, Joaquin can do this, even though deep down, I, I knew he could do it, but I don't think I'd ever seen him do that. I knew he could do intense and off and weird and all of that stuff. And it's very telling, right, that our two masterpieces are kind of opposite ends of the same kind of through line mm -hmm. and yet there is connectivity between those two people and it's authentic and how many people can do that first of all but to that level of mastery and craft and that's why I mean it when I think about that he's one of the best actors working probably and he will always be in the pantheon of the best actors we've ever had because mm -hmm. how many people can do these two movies it's pretty incredible no, oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's that sweetness thing you mentioned, too. I think really, I mean, this is in a way like the sweetest he can. I yeah. mean, he's playing a, a romantic lead on his own, though. That's like, <laughs> that's again, the thing that just like every time I see this, it's just I care so much about their relationship. But she's not yeah. like she's just the voice. I mean, again, I'm not slagging off. Scott Johansson does an incredible job in this movie, too. Amazing. And, yeah. and a lot of what she's able to do just through her voice is credit to her as, as an actress. I think it's just yeah. great. So I'm not trying to diminish what she did, but she's not on the screen. He's more exposed in that sense. Um, so a lot of those scenes that you just talked about when they're in that conversation, and he's finding out that she's talking to other people. She's in love with other people is, yes, it's on her voice performance but just that's just a devastating moment and just you can see that going through him because he's he's the only one on the screen i mean it's this very big close-up of him having to carry the whole thing it's just uh incredible incredible performance and just uh, the film overall too i just again want to one of my favorite movies and i think what spike jones is able to do in terms of really getting into what human connection is what love is I mean, this covers all phases of a relationship, you know, the beginning, the middle and the end, and then how that changes you into finding the next one. I mean, it seems like mm -hmm. he might have a connection with Amy Adams towards the end of the movie that is more than just friends, which I always sort of like how this movie ends. And both for both of them, too, like Joaquin's character and also Scarlett Johansson's AI, they grow because of their relationship into different people. Like she literally upgrades herself mm -hmm. because, because she's shown this love from Joaquin. So then she loves herself and then is able to go through these upgrades to the point where she can't really relate to him anymore. And that's something that can happen to human, human context too. Like you yeah. do evolve and like love changes you and uh, it can change you apart too, in the same way that love can also bring people together, which I think this movie shows both of those things and why it's such a incredible film. And I think one of the, the best of this century so far in tackling these things through a lens of sci-fi. I mean, it's a sci-fi movie, like you said, mm -hmm. but it doesn't let that get in the way of yeah. the, 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 the meaning behind the movie. Yeah. Which is my favorite kind of sci-fi movie. And mm -hmm. they just handled that so well. The look of the movie, the color palette, like so much has sort of been done and said of that. And it's sort of in the culture, if you will, starting this movie. But I have to say, like, he looks so good in this movie. Which, yeah, he does. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's amazing. The, you know, the mustache and sort of the high-waisted pants and just a great look for him, I think. Which again, I was so surprised by when I, when I first saw the movie. I will see the, say though that it's not a movie I revisit a lot or want to. And I don't. I was thinking about that during this watch. Like, why is that? Because this would be very much up my alley. I like. Right. Yeah, I'm romance surprised to movies. Hear that. Oh, see, and, and melancholy. This movie's yeah. all about that, and that's like your favorite emotion. So exactly. I'm surprised through movies, for right? Sure. Yeah. Right through movies. Yeah, yeah I don't mean as a too. person. As a person, <laughs> you're the light of the party, but as through movies, <laughs> yeah. But I, I, I don't know. Maybe 
I have to think more about that from within me as to why is it that I don't come back to this very often. And maybe there is something about the sci-fi aspect, even though it's done in a way where it doesn't date itself very easily because it's in a very distant future, but right. it still feels very relatable. But but there's something about, because it's so specific and unique that before watching the movie, I already know in my head what it looks like and feels like. That the surprise of it is sort of gone in my mind, maybe. Mm. And maybe that's what keeps me at a little bit of a distance. But then when I start watching it, I'm always like, oh, this is just so incredible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I think this is one of Spike Jones's best movies. I don't oh, yeah. come back to it that often either. It's more for just that this movie just deals with almost like too many things that are kind of like hard emotional things to kind of like think, think through your feel through yourself. I mean, again, it's the entire arc of relationship things like what is the meaning of love? What is the meaning of yeah. human connection? Uh, even that, that scene I always find so hard when she hires that woman to be her body. And it's like yeah. the three of them involved in this thing. And he thinks it's awkward. And the other woman is kind of thinks it's awkward. And like, so does Charles Johansson's AI character. And just like, there's almost too much emotion going on in those scenes. I just find that scene in particular so hard to watch and just like gut wrenching because of yeah. what's going on between all three of those or two of those people and one of the computer. So it's a, it's a hard watch for me in that sense. Cause it is so raw and it does deal with things that are just so um, real quote unquote, that it can be tough. And I'm not like, again, it is the melancholy tone of it can be a bit much for me sometimes too, but it's, I do come back to it. You know, every couple of years, I'll I'll put it on and just still be enthralled in it. And to your point in the production design and just the costumes and the settings, it doesn't feel dated still. And it, mm -hmm. but it also doesn't feel like a sci-fi movie like Blade Runner or Metropolis or something. Yeah. Which you know, those can seem dated. Like, oh, this Blade Runner looks like an '80s version of the future, right? Whereas this movie just feels timeless almost it's incredible and in a way it's sort of i think ahead of its time kind of some of the fashion trends even that you mentioned with the you know joaquin with those sunglasses or sunglasses, the glasses and the mustache like that look wasn't as in in 2012 when this movie was made or 2013 when this movie was made than it is now it's almost the, yeah. the, the real life kind of caught up to 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 what this movie i mean how much of that was the movie or just spike jones just throwing darts at a wall and some of them stick but I find that to be the uniqueness about this movie too, because they are able to make it timeless in a way. Yeah. You know, the other movie I was thinking of this time watching it is Past Lives. It has like a very similar, I mean, of course they're about love and relationship, but there's something about the texture of the movies mm -hmm. and the music and how they're framed that, yeah, it's hard to put it in words, but they have this sort of like picture box, picture book kind of look to them, but it's also very, 3d just not visually but also just emotionally i know mm. you were so so in past lives but it made me think of that so this was also my wild card and i put this because this movie stands singularly in my mind from joaquin's performance style or career if you will because it's so much on the sweetness side like we we talked about there's not a bone of you know him being weird and off and and all of the things that we also love about him and, right and it's a it's a true romantic vulnerable melancholic but sweet performance and that's why this is my wild card for him yeah this is, this is a great wild card choice too and i wonder if because the scenario is kind of weird and offbeat like this, the this basic premise of the right. film that he doesn't need to share that burden of being that in the film. He's mm -hmm. actually the opposite of it. He's the most grounded, mm -hmm. realistic. Like you believe this guy could just be a guy. Uh, there's nothing kind of a little bit off. You know, the character in the master, he's a little, he's not really relatable in that sense. I mean, but I get what he's doing. But with this movie, he's just a normal dude because he doesn't have to be more wacky like he does yeah. in some of these other films so that is a unique thing that he's able to to bring to this so i like this as, as a wild card choice too i think yeah. it's uh it, it works and, and actually card in the movie he writes cards greeting cards right and and letters yeah and, so. also such a genius thing i still i'm always like i have like a chuckle or like a smile on my face every time i watch it and i'm taken back to the first time i watch it watched it of thinking oh what a job you know and <laughs> especially in the time and the world that this is set in. It's just such a, yeah, I'm so glad Spike Jones won screenplay for this because it's such a mm -hmm. brilliant screenplay. Like everything kind of fits in. Of course you write cards, you know? Right, <laughs> right, right. It's like you're connecting, you're basically being someone else's love. 
you be involved in their relationship, but not able to have one of your own. You know, there's right. so much stuff. Yeah, that this movie is brilliant, and I'm sure most people have seen it. But if it, folks haven't, highly recommend it. And if you have, definitely give it give it a rewatch. You'll be surprised how much of this holds up. I mean, I guess you could say too, with everything we're dealing with now with AI and the culture, yeah, it has new meaning. It has new. It actually kind of does because some of this stuff feels more potentially real. However, mm -hmm. I like that this movie could have easily. I, mean, I think this movie was made today. It would have been more a comment on, oh, AI gone too far. And like, oh, look, you can't have yeah. an AI be a real human. That's not the same thing as human, you know, human connections. But this movie, you feel for the AI, like the Samantha character yeah. that Scarlett Johansson is playing here. She goes through a lot of the same evolution as a human would. Like, it's not trying to slag her off or say he's weird because this is just a computer. It's not a real relationship. It is a real relationship and from both sides. Yeah. And that's what I think is so brilliant about this movie. And again, if done today, they would have left that part out. And it just would have been some, you know, either condemnation on AI ruining human connections or, oh, you can't find a real connection or real love through an AI. I mean, this movie, you we meant that might be true. I'm mean, not pro AI at all, but um, I think this movie doesn't take that that path, and that's what makes it so special and so cool that her she's going through the same things he is, even though she's not quote unquote real. But then what is real, and you know, all that stuff yeah. is floating in there too. But that's the thing, right? Like the the AI of it and the future world of it just it just happens to be the movie mm -hmm. is about love and relationships. Right. And that to me is the best use of sci-fi because anything else that you want to try to do in terms of commentary and such will not last and wouldn't be timeless. And you'll probably get too lost in that. But if you make it about what it's really about, then the rest of it sort of just has room to breathe and you can interpret it in different ways, you know? So it's just Absolutely. so smart that way. No, totally. And that's when you know, great sci-fi, you, you encapsulate exactly what great science fiction can do when it's done right. It's everything yeah. you just said. And this movie definitely does that. Okay. So we are at the end of our list. What is your wild card? So my wild card is Napoleon from 2023 from last year. This is uh, directed by Ridley Scott, starring Joaquin Phoenix, Vanessa Kirby, and the INDB plot summary an epic that details the checkered rise and fall of French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte and his relentless journey to power through the prism of his addictive, volatile relationship with his wife, Josephine. So I put this on here as a, as a wild card because this movie, to me, I'll get into my thoughts on the overall film, was disappointing and didn't really work on what I was maybe going and expecting or definitely upon rewatch able to accomplish. And a lot of that, honestly, I put at the feet of Joaquin Phoenix. And I think this movie was him overstepping what I think could have been a more interesting portrayal of Napoleon had it been another actor. So in a way, this is a wild card because I think it's a misfire for choosing him to be in this film, firstly. And then secondarily, the way that he decided to portray Napoleon in this movie... I think brings the movie down instead of elevates it. Get into a little more of the thoughts on that, but I'm just curious on, to you in terms of what you what you think of the film, and then we can discuss more about my issues with Joaquin and the movie. Yeah, I'm actually a defender of this movie. I mean, I understand all the gripes with it, and am I going to go back and watch this movie? Am I going to go watch the extended cut? Probably not. Maybe they send it cut if I had that kind of time. <laughs> but I actually was quite intrigued by what Ridley did, which is it, it's not your conventional biopic at all. It's not a history lesson. It's really not interested in a lot of that. Yeah, you get the beats and the facts, but it's in, it, it really is more of a character study, but like a mood piece, if you will, through Joaquin and his relationship with Josephine, played by Vanessa Kirby, who I think is excellent in the movie. Where She's she great. More to do in the movie, and maybe she does in the extended cut. But in saying that, I also kind of like the the balls, if you will, not just from Ridley, but also from Joaquin, that there's no accent work. There is no what you expect from like some actor, like diving deep and playing Bonaparte and, you know, trying to create what this person would feel like and be like, instead is sort of getting at the very no bullshit heart of the matter that this person was brilliant in what they did on the field, but otherwise was really insecure and struggled with his relationship with his wife and 
instead of being like an actual human being, even though they were brilliant otherwise. And I think Joaquin gets at the heart of that. It's just not laced with all the other things in the paraphernalia that you expect in a in a biopic which i understand then you bring up the question of like then why even make a biopic you know you just could have been a different story of like a regular person who's maybe brilliant at their job but you know not good otherwise or unsure otherwise but i think that's what makes it interesting and i think it's pretty ballsy to make a movie about probably one of the most known people in the history of time and make it this way so i don't know i it's not fully successful at times drags and maybe gets too dour and the color palette and all of that gets in the way and maybe Joaquin gets in the way as well from a conventional point of view of a biopic of a character like this but I kind of like it that's that's all those things so yeah I, I can hear I can hear that like for me the movie is odd because it feels like a and this is a lot on Ridley Scott too which I'll get into to him in a bit yeah, but it's him if, it feel, if yeah but it feels like a takedown of Napoleon and instead of a kind of expose on who he actually is like a lot of what we just talked about in Walk the Line another biopic where they were using these things that happened to Johnny Cash to give you a sense of who he was as a person and then how he was able to then get that into his music and understand his music better in this movie, you know, Napoleon, like you said, is one of the most famous people that has ever lived. He was loved by his men. They follow him into battle. They even after he like in the movie depicts, he comes back from exile and the, the men, instead of arresting him, follow him mm-hmm. against the wishes of uh, the French government at the time. And he was known. I and mean, we have all the letters that he wrote to Josephine. A lot of them were dictated in this movie. The letters actually between the two of them. And he was known for being a ladies man who was very good at that, too. And then this movie makes you wonder, like, OK, where in this movie is a guy who anyone would want to follow into battle? He's this weird guy who doesn't really talk very much. He acts like a petulant child all the time. You know, there's a scene where he's sitting down with the, the, the French government and he's basically lambasting all of them. Like, oh, you guys haven't done anything and you're just a bunch of layabouts. You know, the government is falling apart. I blame all you. And the way that Joaquin is performing that, it's not guy coming in and sort of like, quote unquote, like cleaning up the swamp. And it's like, hey, look. I'm I know what I'm doing. You guys don't. So you're all fired. And let me kind of get in here and figure out what to do, because I am this amazing tactician, amazing general. It comes across as like a kid just sort of like complaining to a bunch of adults and a child. But like, that's not Napoleon. Or if that is what you're going to say he was, then explain it to why then he was such a master on the field. And I don't mean just intellectually, like planning out the battles. His men loved this guy and the women loved this guy. And this movie is portrayed as this guy who's socially awkward through most of the film, terrible at sex. He's asking some other younger guy for like, okay, how do you please a woman? It's like, we know this guy was amazing in bed. Like, that is a historical fact. Like, why are you trying to tear this guy down? And a lot of it, as I think, is Joaquin's performance in this movie as some socially awkward weirdo who just sort of history is happening around him instead of him driving history, which I will say, maybe this is my own, you know, POV. Like, I don't believe in the great main theory. I don't believe humans can change history. Things, I'm a materialist. Things are not predetermined, but the material conditions are what defines history, not individuals. But there are there are very few exceptions to that. And one of those is Napoleon. If he was not born, the world would not have ended up the way that it did. It, it is really down to him. And this movie kind of flips that. And it's like, well, actually, he's just this weird guy and things are happening around him. And even though he's not acting in a way that seems to be steering history. Oh, well, he right place, right time, Napoleon, which, you know, again, I'll, I'll get more into Ridley Scott thing, but. Why did Joaquin need to portray him so oddly in all facets? It wasn't like behind the scenes is weird, you know, socially awkward with Josephine, but battlefield and government. He's this commanding force that everyone loves and wants to follow, which granted, there are a couple scenes. The battle scenes are incredible, right. uh, both Austerlitz and then also Waterloo. Amazing. I wish I wish the movie was more that Napoleon versus what we got. It just ir- it irritated me. And a lot of that I put again at Joaquin's. I think if it was another actor, they would have portrayed him in a way that I think was more interesting. That's that's sort of my my take. Yeah, I hear you. I mean, to me, that's what makes it interesting. And and I think that's what they're going for, Ridley and, and Joaquin. So it's not Joaquin, it's Ridley. And yes, it he's is on the same <laughs> yeah. page as he is. And that's what they're going for. And maybe they followed him because that's sort of what was going on back then. You know, maybe they saw the genius, but they were also aware of the fact that this person is sort of weird. You know, what do we know? History is often told by 
the people who have power and control. So maybe we've only seen one side of it and maybe there was this other side. So yeah, it's it's fascinating to me that, and yeah, maybe they just followed him no matter what, <laughs> you know? Yeah, I mean, it, it, to your point about, you know, yes, history is written by the victors or whatever that, that yeah. expression is. And, you know, my theory behind this is, you know, Ridley's a British director yeah, there's that, and the Brits yeah. hate Napoleon because he whooped their asses multiple different times and, you yeah. know, play them for a fool. And I, this movie to me feels like a takedown of Napoleon simply because the British are jealous that he was so amazing and that he wasn't British. I, I just still, so I actually, when I rewatched yeah. this, I watched the director's cut, which was better, but still the problems with this movie are still just that this sort of tone. And it still just strikes me that at the end of the film, they, instead of like, a, you know, facts about what happened afterwards in terms of in France or whatever, like Napoleon dies at the end. Spoiler alert, I guess, Napoleon is dead. But they they list out like all of his battles on the screen and the number of people that were killed in them. And sort of like says, oh, in Napoleonic Wars, like, you know, this many people died across Europe. And it's in a way it's like, what are you blaming this guy for that? Like, and first of all, like who who are these people that died? Like, are we supposed to just be sad for all of them? It's like thing that happens a lot in those people that are like, oh, communism has killed like 50 million people in the 20th century. The, some of those dead happen to be Nazis who the Russians killed during World War II. I'm like, I think those dead are good. Like, let's let's put that in the win category <laughs> of like who was killed by communism. I'm very happy that communism killed those people. So don't lump them in in the same way that like, what am I trying to get out of this other than this guy was weird and he killed a lot of people in Europe and thank God he's gone. But sort of, I think the hypothesis of this movie that just still just bothers me when I see it, but maybe you're right. Maybe this is like really trying to be, well, the French have, you know, given this guy too much credit. So as a British guy, I'm going to rip him down. So at least there's another side to it. Maybe that's what he's doing. Yeah, but I think that's good, right? Like there are two sides to everything. And no, everybody knows yeah. about the greatness and there've been, you know, movies and documentaries and books and this and that. But I think it's sort of interesting to approach it from a different side. And to me, that ending is more of, yeah, they can be great men, but they come with a lot of toll and cost. And it's not so much about who the individual, each person was who was killed. The fact is that there was so much of destruction with these wars. Now, it's not to say that he's the only one to be blamed, but yeah, if you are the kind of the face of victory and strategy, you're also the face of war and destruction, even though you probably had some to do with both, not all. I think it's interesting that they did this. Yeah, it is. It's interesting. And I wanted to like it when I saw it and I didn't. I wanted to like the director's cut. But like the DNA of this film that I mentioned is just how I bump up against it. And as someone who loves Ridley Scott, I was wanting more of, I guess, traditional look at maybe just both sides then. Like at least show the good stuff that Napoleon did across Europe and throw in the other stuff. And then it's, oh, it's complicated. All these good things happen. And yet mm -hmm. also like all these people were killed and he was kind of a weirdo. It's mm -hmm. like, okay, at least that would sort of be interesting instead of this thing, which maybe they pre-assume you know all that stuff. It's That's like, well, you know, doing, yeah. everyone loves Napoleon for all these different reasons. So I'm just going to show you all the things that kind of look bad. I mean, hell, even the French Revolution, I felt was sort of painted in a negative light. You know, they start the movie with the queen, you know, Marie Antoinette getting killed and yeah. position it as some horrible thing where you sort of feel bad for her. I don't know that, that it's like you start off and the oh, they killed a bunch of nuns. OK, that sucks. But like, what are you saying? The French Revolution should have happened and the monarchy was good. Like, come on, Ridley, like get with the program a little bit. I mean, the, the, maybe the screen or I don't know. I don't want to point too many figures. I was disappointed, I guess, <laughs> in this and think that a lot of that is due to Joaquin's performance, too. It just was too oddball. No, I think that's the point. And even those people who are died, they're also still people, you know? I think it's good to see that. And yeah, maybe they deserved it, but death is still death. That's sort of what I think, you know? Fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> that was Napoleon, and those were our top three. So now this is the part of the episode where we talk about what we want Joaquin to do next. I definitely don't want him to make Napoleon 2 or Joker <laughs> 3. Not Joker 3, for sure. I think it'll be fun for him to kind of get back to his sweetness register. Like he made a movie with Mike Mills, Come On, Come On, which is once again in that register. It's a very sweet movie. I found the child of the kid actor a little annoying and irritating, but which is you know bad to say, but that's kind of how I felt. I still like that movie and I like Mike Mills a lot. So yeah, I would love Joaquin to kind of come back to that a little bit and also maybe not play a historic figure for a little bit. Somebody more in the her, come on, come on category. Maybe a low-key romance of sorts. I think that'll be fun to see him do. What do you say? 
Yeah, it's similarly, like I said at the beginning of the episode, after kind of like mainlining all these performances, I am sort of getting tired of his like shtick and his thing. And I'd love to see him go back to like a walk the line, very kind of mainstream leading man movie, potentially romance, because I do think that he can pull that off. Even at his age, I think he could still be a, a romantic lead and just sort of leave these things behind him for a little bit and go back to a four quadrant kind of like middle of the road mainstream movie where he's able to bring his talents to that and elevate it in the way that he did with Walk the Line or even Her, which I think is not necessarily main. It was an indie movie, but the sweetness was there. So I think we're kind of saying similar things and definitely no Joker 3. Yeah, Maybe this will be his excising of that whole thing where he needs to do all the body transformations and the weird this and the weird that. It's like, yeah, I'm I'm over it. <laughs> just yeah, just, just give me keep walking the line. Walk the line too. Yeah, I don't. I think it'll be hard for him to do like a four quadrant mainstream movie. But I think yes, like the oddball indie movie, but more of the sweetness, romantic tone, sort of feels more up his alley. I think, or mm -hmm. and that's what I would like to see him do. Also, he's older now, so doing a walk the line like movie doesn't seem right. So why don't you tease our listeners with the episode we have coming up in two weeks? Yeah, so we're going to cover like another, I think, brilliant actor in Ray Fiennes. He has a new movie coming out with Conclave, somebody that we've touched on some movies of his, but have never really had a chance to talk deeply about Ray Fiennes. So that's who we will cover next time. Sounds good. I'm excited for Conclave. And you can join us on our Ray Fiennes journey in two weeks. So we hope you enjoyed the discussion today. Be sure to let us know in the comments what you thought about Joaquin, Joker 2, and all the other films that we discussed today. So we're available here on YouTube as well as on all podcast platforms. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already done so. Also, rate and review us and like this video as that really helps new listeners find our show. We're always trying to grow. So with that, we'll see you in the Ray Fines discussion. Well, I guess maybe I was a little too hard on Napoleon. It gave us the line... I am enjoying a succulent breakfast. <laughs> so it can't be that bad.